Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're breaking down those final checks before the finish line, third trimester fetal imaging. Right. We're looking at why late-term ultrasounds, specialized Dopplers, and sometimes even MRIs are done. Our mission for you, the listener, is to really get why these scans are performed and the crucial roadmap they give for delivery planning. Okay, let's unpack this. Yeah, and it's important to stress, these aren't like the routine 20-week anatomy scan everyone gets. Not standard procedure, then. No, not at all. Think of them more as a vital safety net. They're typically reserved for specific concerns. Mm -hmm. Maybe the baby's measuring a bit small or perhaps large for dates, or if the mother has certain conditions, uh, like diabetes or high blood pressure. Ah, so serial scans might be needed then. Exactly. For those women, serial growth scans are absolutely essential. We need to confirm the baby's doing well in those final weeks. Okay, so let's say someone comes in for a standard third trimester scan. What are the basics you're measuring first? Growth, presumably? Yes, growth is the starting point. We're looking closely at, well, the standard biometry. Things like the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the length of the thigh bone, the femur. And those give you the estimated weight. Correct. We combine those to get an estimated fetal weight. Well, but, you know, size is only part of the picture. If those measurements raise a flag, we need to dig deeper. That's where we look at the baby's actual physiological status using more specialized tools. Right. You mentioned a kind of report card earlier. That sounds like the biophysical profile, the BPP. That's the one. And what's fascinating here is that the BPP is basically a five-point check on fetal well-being. Five points? What are they grading? We score uh, breathing movements, general body movements, muscle tone, like opening and closing a hand, heart rate patterns over time, yeah. and amniotic fluid volume. A good score, usually 8 or 10 out of 10, suggests the baby is well oxygenated and, you know, thriving. Let's pause on that amniotic fluid part. Seems like a simple thing to measure, just the amount of fluid, but the implications can be pretty significant. Oh, absolutely. Fluid levels are a really key indicator. Low fluid, uh, oligohydramnios, affects maybe 4% of pregnancies. And what does low fluid tell you? Well, it could mean potential kidney issues or sometimes growth restriction. Plus, the baby needs that fluid for cushioning and, crucially, for proper lung development. And the opposite. Too much fluid. Polyhydramnios. That's less common. Maybe 1%. Severe cases can point to maternal diabetes or issues with the baby swallowing properly, maybe digestive tract problems. It also, unfortunately, increases the risk of preterm labor quite a bit. Okay, so beyond the BPP, there's the Doppler study. This sounds more technical measuring flow, not just size. That's exactly right. Doppler ultrasound measures the speed and resistance of blood flow, primarily in the umbilical cord arteries. Like a plumbing check, you said? Kind of, yeah. We're checking how easily blood flows from the placenta to the baby. If the resistance is high, it tells us the placenta, the baby's lifeline, might not be working optimally. So poor flow means poor nutrient and oxygen delivery. Precisely. And when we see abnormal patterns, especially if blood flow starts getting restricted or even reversed in crucial vessels, like in the brain, well, that guides major decisions on timing delivery. It's often the key trigger for intervention if a baby isn't growing well. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting, I think. Fetal MRI. Ultrasound gives so much info already. When do you need the kind of detail an MRI provides? Yeah, MRI isn't common. It's reserved for pretty high stakes situations, usually when ultrasound findings aren't totally clear or we need really detailed structural information, often for planning surgery. What kinds of situations warrant that level of detail? Two main reasons usually trigger it. One is suspected brain abnormalities. An MRI can give much clearer pictures of brain structures, helping confirm things like uh, ventricular megaly that's extra fluid in the brain's ventricles or checking if parts of brain are developing correctly. The other big one is suspected placenta accreta spectrum. Accreta, that's when the placenta attaches too deeply. Exactly. It grows into or even through the uterine wall. This often happens after previous C-sections. Yeah. Knowing the exact location and depth of invasion before delivery is critical. An MRI provides a surgical roadmap. It helps plan for a complex delivery, ensuring the right surgical team is there, blood products are ready. It can prevent catastrophic bleeding for the mother. Makes sense. And quickly on safety, ultrasound uses sound waves, very safe. MRI doesn't use ionizing radiation, so it's considered safe in pregnancy, especially later on. Is there any specific safety consideration with MRI? The main one is about contrast agents. 
gadolinium contrast. Ah, the dye they sometimes inject. Right. Gadolinium does cross a placenta, and we know it can be retained in fetal tissues for a while. So the current guidelines strongly advise against using it during pregnancy unless it's absolutely essential to diagnose a serious condition in the mother. Otherwise, fetal MRIs are done without contrast. Got it. So, you know, if we connect this to the bigger picture, all this late-term imaging, whether it's a BPP, a Doppler, or that rare MRI, it's all geared towards one thing, ensuring the safest possible delivery. We're gathering information to identify potential problems early and manage risks. And it's worth remembering, even when we find abnormalities, they're often manageable with careful planning. So what does this all mean for parents-to-be? It means we have these incredible tools now, the ability to measure not just size, but blood flow, fetal behavior through the BPP, gives doctors this amazing precision to manage those critical final weeks. And here's something to think about. Monitoring these subtle physiological things, the amount of fluid, how blood is flowing, it's not just about the baby's current state. It allows healthcare teams to actually predict potential systemic issues before they become a crisis. An imaging session near the end of pregnancy essentially becomes a detailed predictive health check. That predictive power, I think, is the real marvel here.